like I told you before, we're back. I was down bad. I was sick a couple of weeks ago and, you know, getting back in the groove. And now we're back and we're going through Hebrews chapter 10, which I am uh, actually uh, super excited to get into. Um, we've been working through Hebrews for uh, a couple months, partly because it's a long book, partly because uh, <laughs> me. But uh, we're working through Hebrews chapter 10 right now. We just got um, through 9 a couple a couple weeks ago, uh, we are three books away from three chapters away from being done with Hebrews. After this is the infamous Hall of Faith, and uh, in Hebrews eleven, and you know the infamous scriptures about faith. Uh, so looking forward to getting to that, and it's very interesting to to me. <sighs> And these are the things that we're going to discuss. It's very interesting to me that this, the content of Hebrews chapter 10 is before 11. You know what I mean? So like when we think about faith, we often think about it as like um, just believing. Sometimes I'm not going to make a, a broad thing, but like sometimes we think about faith is just believing that the thing that you want God to do, He will do, right? And Hebrews is a is where a lot of those kind of quotes come from. But here's the thing: when He's talking about faith in Hebrews chapter eleven, what I think sometimes we miss is that it's tied to. 10 old, whole other books prior to. He's not just randomly talking about Christian topics. And when he gets to Hebrews 11, he just decides, okay, let's randomly talk about faith, disconnect it from everything else that we were talking about. And I do, obviously, faith can be more than a just faith for salvation. But sometimes when we when we think about faith, we only think about it in the context of those broad terms. Or, or those not even, I'm sorry, actually the opposite, those very narrow terms where faith is, I believe that God will do the thing that I want that I want him to do. And so when we look at where we're we're going through 10 right now, but uh when we look at 10, I think I think you'll find it interesting where it is that he, that he is dealing with this and then he goes into faith. I would encourage us to even think about it like even how we think about sin, right? So right now for us sin a lot of times is uh you know doing the wrong thing, breaking the excuse me, breaking the law or, you know, or like, okay, breaking the law, but you know what I mean? Like God says, this is bad. You do it. Uh, shame on you sin. And so when he talks about sin, there's this, there's the assumption that he's just talking about behavior. But if we stay with, and this is why I'm glad we've kind of been doing this slow walk through Hebrews. If we stay through this slow walk through Hebrews, you see that, and I think this can definitely apply to behavior, but this context of sin where, and you know, we always say it, you know, sin is missing the mark, X, Y, Z, and we're going to look uh, more into that today. But this context of sin is not just behavior. I, I would even say primarily behavior in Hebrews chapter 10, but he is talking about uh, belief, and uh, we will we will look in we'll look at we'll look at that today in context with the rest of Hebrews. So, Hebrews chapter ten. Without any further ado, let's get into it because I'm actually uh, super excited to talk about this book. All right, so Hebrews chapter ten. We're going to start at verse one. Actually, you know what we got to do? We got to go back because we're trying to get context. Right? We're trying to remember. What it is we were talking about? So let's start uh, at 23. Now, remember, Hebrews 9 was essentially discussing how the things of the Old Testament were just a shadow 
or like a uh, a sketch of the of, of, of what Christ really did. So we talked about the high priest and the role of the high priest and how they would go and offer sins and offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. But they also had to offer sacrifices on behalf of themselves. And then the writer of Hebrews, he makes a great point because, again, he is establishing, for lack of a better word, the supremacy of Christ over these things. Because when me and you hear these things, it may not have the same type of context. We're like, oh, oh, yeah, okay, Christ is our high priest. But for them, this was a this was a big deal. And and he's talking to believers who appear to not be on the fence with like losing God and obeying the law, but they are dealing with persecution and uh, facing difficulty because of their belief in Jesus. And so what the writer of Hebrews is trying to encourage and establishing, establishing them is that if you guys respect these things, angels, Moses, the law, whatever, Christ is above these things. These things are just a sketch or shadow of the work that Christ is doing. So he, he compared and talked about the work of the priests and how they go and offer sacrifices. And he talked about how Christ, he did not go into the holies of holies made by man, but he went into the actual holies of holies of God and offered not the sacrifice of animals, but the sacrifice of his blood so that we uh, can be forgiven, so that we can be uh, restored back into proper relationship with God. And so this is what we were kind of dealing with in chapter 9. It's going to continue on here in 10. So let's start at... 32, he says, it was necessary for the sketch of things, again, this is nine, for the sketch of things in heaven to be purified with these sketches, but the heavenly things themselves to be purified with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter into the sanctuary by hands, uh, sorry, Christ did not enter into a sanctuary made by hands, a mere copy of the true one but into heaven itself and near and now appear now to appear in the presence of God on whose behalf on our behalf and not that in order that um and not in order that he can offer himself many times as high priest enter into the sanctuary year by year with with blood not of his own since it I'm sorry, since it would have been necessary for him to suffer many times from the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared once at the end of ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. Right. So that's what we talked about. And just as it is destined for people to die once and after this judgment, thus also Christ having offered, Christ having been offered once in order to appear in order to bear the sins of many, will appear for a second time without reference, reference to sin to those who eagerly await for his salvation. And now we go into 10. For the law possessing a shadow, as, as uh, the theme kind of been consistent so far, uh, for the law possessing a shadow of the good things that are about to come, not the form of things itself. It is never able year by year by means of the, of the same sacrifices which they offer without interruption to make perfect those who draw near. So the law, which is a shadow of the good things to come, cannot make perfect by means of the same sacrifice Year by year, those who draw near. All right. Uh, and uh, continuing on, he says, for likewise, for otherwise, would they have ceased to be offered, right? So if like the sacrifices were good enough to make you clean, then they, and good before God, then they would not have to continuously happen. For otherwise, they would have, Ceased to be offered because the one who worships, having been purified once and for all, would no longer. And this is, 
<sighs> this is important. We no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in them, there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. This is extremely interesting because if you, if, if you think about it, what, and we talked about this a little bit before, like here, he's talking about the, the work that Christ did on the cross to cleanse us of our sins. But here he also mentions the consciousness of sins. And, and later he says again, um, the important work of Christ cleaning our conscience. Let me see if I, 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 I we'll, we'll read that. We'll, we'll go to that later, but I, I think, Part of it has to do with how we in like a modern American context look at sin. And that is that like sin is basically, and it is, but it's like sin is just basically disobedience. It's like God told us not to do something and we did it. Therefore we sinned. That is not, the traditional viewpoint of sin when it came to the writers of scripture. Cause again, sin in our modern context has developed its own kind of like meaning. It's just like wrong. Something that's like, if you went around and asked people what's sin, they would maybe say uh, something that is evil, something that is X, Y, Z. But in um, ancient with ancient, in, a, in ancient, uh, like Israel times, sin was a breaking of the covenant. We, you know, if you've been in church long enough, you probably heard them say, like, sin is uh, missing the mark, right? But it's not so much just the behavior, but it's also it also represented a breaking of the relationship. So it's like, it's not just what you did, it's now how what you did has impacted our standing with each other and our relationships. And if you think about it, we all have covenants, right? We all have things. A covenant was, and this is my just kind of rough summary, it is the agreement upon which we have a relationship. And so if you if you think about it, we all have covenants. We all have things that if someone did, we would say, okay, this person is no longer my friend. Or let's say, um, maybe for some people, it could be lying, right? Some people are like, man, if you lie to me, we, we can't be friends. Or I'm trying to think, what's mine? Mine is if you try to, I, I, I don't know the right way to say it, but like if you try to throw me under the bus, like if it's like me or you and you, you're like, you choose you, then we can be associates, but we won't be, for me, we won't be friends because uh, with my friends, we're always trying to, we're, we're equally trying to look out for each other. Like I'm not going to put you in the compromising position. I believe you're not going to do the same for me, X, Y, Z. And then also, you know, we won't do anything dishonest in order to kind of get ahead, you know, at, at someone else's expense, but actually, whatever, that's my, that's my thing. Like if I see somebody and I feel like they are, yeah, if it came between me and them, they would always choose them at my expense. Then that person, I just would not um, consider them my friend. That would, that would change our relationship. And le again, for simplicity, let's say for you is lying, right? If somebody lies to you, you're like, man, I cannot be friends with a liar. And so let's say you had a friend who lied to you, right? They lied to you or even they lied on you. Now, technically, the, 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 the sin or the thing that they did wrong is 
they lied on you. Or let's say they, uh, this might be an easy one, they stole from you. Let's say they stole money from you. And let's say they stole money from you, you found out, but then they gave you the money back. So let's say technically in our context, the sin would be them stealing the money. But it's really not about that. It's how about it's about how what they did affected the relationship between us. So yes, you stole you, you money from me. You might even gave me the money back. But that action has now affected our relationship. It's just not the same. It just it it, it cannot be restored to how it was. And so it's like if that person came back to you and they were like, yes, I stole it. I'm sorry. Forgive me. How can, how can our relationship be stored back to like this never happened? And this is where we're starting to get into atonement and redemption. And so when ancient Israelites and Hebrews thought about sin, it wasn't just the action. It was the breaking of the covenant and the relationship that they had with God. And so when it talks about cleansing their conscience, yes, I can make this atonement for sins, but as he point out, as he point points out here, every time that I would go to offer that um, offering, it would remind me of my sin. It would it would remind me of the wrong that I did to you, and it would. It would always, it could make me feel like, are we good? And so if you can imagine it, if there's someone who you wronged and maybe you feel really bad that you wronged them and you're trying to make that wrong right, but they can still sometimes be in you every time it comes up, every time you think about it, this thing of like, but is what... I offered is what I've done because of it, it is what I've done in repentance good enough to make us good again. And so they could, ha they could be offering these offerings, but their consciences were not necessarily clear. Uh, consciences, they were not necessarily confident that I am in restored, right, and perfect relationship with God. And that, and, and this, this is why, appears to be why so much of their belief system was built on works, because it's this thing of constantly trying to ensure, and to make sure, and to repair uh, a right standing with God. So how can I be sure, a hundred percent? that me and you are good, that me and you are good. And I think this is the power of what the work that Christ has done for us. And that is, I know that why, that me and him are good because, oh man, this thing goes to sleep and it don't come back. I know that me and him are good because he has done the work of redemption on my behalf. So it's like it no longer becomes about the work that I could do or the thing that I'm trying to do to be restored. It is, you, you know, the scripture says, yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the question of, am I good with God, is not an issue because he initiated, he initiated, the one who was, uh, the one who was wronged. Again, it's like if your friend stole from you and, you know, they felt really bad, but then you initiated this grand act this gesture, you know, and I hate to just call the work of Christ a gesture, um, but you you initiated this grand gesture on their behalf to show them that you guys are good. 
And so now the question of you guys' relationship is not really in question because you initiated the act. You did it. So we we wronged God, but he initiated the act of redemption through the sacrifices of Jesus Christ. So now I'm not working for something that he has proven that I already have because he chosen. So if we go here now, my um, see if I can get this thing back. We might have to rock just uh, old old fashioned. I don't know if that's coming back. Um, if we if we keep going down, Hebrews. Let's go to chapter. Yeah. Let's go to Hebrews chapter five, not five, sorry. We're still in Hebrews chapter 10. Actually, I want to read this scripture. Let's go to uh, Isaiah 53. Come on, somebody. I was thinking about this. Yeah. Isaiah 53, starting in verse one. Uh, shout out to Pastor Dave. We used to read this every day before every message. And uh, for a while I had memorized it because I, I, I heard it so much. Um, but it is a very uh, powerful scripture. It says, who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He went up like a shoot before him, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form, no comeliness, no majesty, that when we saw that, that, that we should see him, no majesty that we should see him, and no appearance that we should take pleasure in him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of suffering acquainted with sickness and like one from whom from whom others hide their faces he was despised we did not hold him in high regard however he was lifted up for he was lifted up for our sicknesses he carried our pain yet we, yet we ourselves assumed him stricken down by God and afflicted. It's just, you know, Isaiah, and it's so interesting, you know, a lot of times people can, I, I see sometimes pastors talk about Jesus and, you know, he's rich and X, Y, Z, and like, you know, he was just this popular character a uh, person is like, no, like, you know, we're reading it. He had no form, no company, there's no beauty, no beauty. There's nothing when we see him when we would desire him. He was afflicted, ab abused, despised. He was ac acquainted uh, with grief or sickness. And when we saw him stricken, we assumed that he was just being punished by God, that he had deserved that, having no idea that what they were witness, witnessing, what he was going through, was for their own redemption. And so um, Isaiah continued on. He says, yet we ourselves assumed him stricken, smitten down by God and afflicted, but he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his wounds we are healed. All of us have wandered away, wandered about like sheep. We have each turned to his own way, and Yahweh let fall on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was brought up like a lamb to the shears, and like the sheep is done before shearers, he did not open his mouth. Picture this. You have... Jesus, who is enduring the, we're looking at him like, man, this dude is, is going through, not aware that this is happening for our benefit, for our benefit. And then the, 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 the cost for our sin, our foolishness, us leaving and going away was put on him, was put on him. And he, in that, did not open his mouth. 
He didn't say, I'm going to stop this. I didn't do this. This is not mine. This is theirs. Like, he just, he just endured it. Um, eight, he was taken and constrained by justice. Who, who will concern himself with his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living. He received a blow because of the transgression of the people. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Although he did no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet Yahweh pleased, I'm sorry, yet Yahweh was pleased to crush him. He made him sick. Uh, if she places his guilt offering, sorry, places guilt, uh, his life as a guilt offering, he shall, he shall see his offspring and he will prolong his days and the will of Yahweh will succeed his hand. And so saying like, yeah, it's, he will see the reward of his suffering here. For for the trouble of his life, he will see and will be satisfied. In this knowledge, uh, the in uh, sorry, in his knowledge, the righteous ones, my servants, shall declare many righteous. And so, do I want to keep reading? Uh, we'll, we'll we'll go back to uh, to Hebrews, but I, I I wanted to read that because all of that is like the things that happen. For us, and going back to kind of the analogy of like, if you had wronged someone, and how would you know that you guys are good? Are good? Just think about what Christ had to go through so that you and I could know that we are good, that we're good. All the suffering, all the pain, all the things that he that he had to endure so that he could pay the cost for our disobedience so that we can be restored and confident in our relationship with God. And this is why a lot of people get this confused. I don't know if we'll be able to get to it today. We'll see um, when we get to Hebrews chapter 6. And it talks about like if we willfully sin after hearing the truth of XYZ. And now kind of a modern context, our brain always goes to like behavioral sin. But again, if you if you think about the context of the book and why he's writing, who he's writing to, and what it is that he's trying to accomplish, um the the sin here really isn't just behavior, it's really just belief. It's this temptation for them to know the work that Christ has done for them, to know the suffering and everything that he's went through, but to ignore it and try to establish a righteousness of their own outside of his suffering. And this is what, uh, what, what the writer addresses. All right, um, Let's, let's read down to this. We'll see how far we go. Hebrews 10, starting at verse 5, it says, Therefore he came into the world. Therefore when he came into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offerings you did not want, but a body you have prepared for me. There's some interesting things about that scripture. We I probably won't be able to get to. Uh, you did not delight in the whole burnt offering and the offerings of sins, then I said, behold, I have come in the role of the book. It is written about me to do your will, O Lord. When he says sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings, sorry, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and, and offerings for sin you did not want, nor did you delight in, which are offered according to the law. And then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. So he's, so he's saying, like, I have not come to give you more of what you did not delight in, right? So I've come to do your will, and behold, um, burnt, offers, burnt offerings, sacrifices, those things you did not delight in. Yeah, th those things according to the law you did not delight in, but behold, I have come to do your will. And so the writer says, here he takes away the first in order to establish the second, by which will we are all made holy 
through the offering of the body of Christ once and for all. Every priest stands every day serving and offering the same sacrifices many times, which are never able to take away sins. But this one, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Now, we, we've been saying this before. Do you believe the belief? What, is, what does that mean when we really wrestle through and think about the, these two scriptures? That there is one sacrifice for sin. That sacrifice was made. And verse 12 says, but this one, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, he sat down at the right hand of God. And, and again, we'll see later, he challenges these people to say, like, if you're going to look at Christ's suffering for your sin as nothing and try to establish a righteousness of your own, there's nothing, there's nothing outside of that but wrath. There's nothing outside of the redemptive grace, the sacrifice that, that Christ made for your sins. There's nothing around that. Outside of that is just the expectation of wrath. But anyway, we will uh, get to that in uh, verse 13. He says, from now on, waiting until his enemies are made, are made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us saying, this is the covenant that I will declare to them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and I will write them in their minds. This, this kind of goes back to when we were reading about, um, it may actually may have been in nine or eight, we talked about the new covenant that he wanted to establish that each person would not like go to, uh, had to teach his neighbor about the Lord, but that all would know him, that this, this thing would not just be, this is the God that I heard about, but each individual will be able to have a relationship with God. So um, going on, he also says, their sins and lawless deeds I will never remember again. I mean, think about this. Like, do we, do we believe this? Now, again, there's this, there's this tension. There's like, okay, well, if Christ died for our sins, then I can just do whatever I want. Oh, doesn't that mean that, 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 uh, you know, we can just run buck wild. And I think if that is the thought process that comes to your mind, you miss the point because faith, and again, I think maybe it's tied to how we define faith as faith is just believing God. It's, it's not faith. Another word for faith is always say faithfulness or believing um our Dr. Michael has to say today, believing loyalty. There is a dedication. There is a commitment to you because of what I believe. So because of the work of Jesus Christ, because of what he has done for me, I am committed to him. I do not see grace, mercy, and forgiveness of sins as an opportunity to exploit, but I see it as an opportunity to remain so that as I am pursuing God, when I do mess up, when I do fail, I, it is not the end going back to that connection thing um, and uh, atonement. It is not the end of our relationship that at each marker and moment of sin as I am 
trying to grow in my relationship with God and I'm trying to, to love him better, each time that I mess up, I don't see it as the end of our relationship. I, and because I have grace, we can I can stand up and keep moving. Now, if I see the redemptive work of Christ and what, and what God has done on the cross, but I do not want to remain faithfully loyal to him, then no, you don't have access to that grace. It, it, it is, you know, we, we are saved by faith. The grace is like there is a... There is a commitment there, and that's kind of the, you know, and there's nothing wrong with this in his prayer. I think that is the sometimes the lack of clarity that the sinner's prayer and kind of how we mark when someone is saved doesn't really uh, speak to. And that is like, you know, people feel like, okay, I can say these words, and then after I say these words, I can just leave. I can just do what I want. But it's like, no, it's like a it's a commitment. It's like when you get married, you you say your vows, right? But those vows are those vows don't make you, you know what I mean? Like you still have to live those vows to really have a marriage, to really have a real marriage. Right, you have to write your vows. You say them, and and yes, you do the ceremony, and you're married. But like, if you if you took those vows and you never saw your spouse again, you never talked to them again. Like, freak was on paper. You guys don't have a relationship. You guys don't have a marriage. And there are some believers that kind of have a similar relationship with God. Like, as long as I can say this prayer and I did this thing, I said my vows. I can, I don't have to be faithfully loyal to him. I can just do whatever I want, and, and you know, and, and that's not the case. And uh, he'll kind of get into a little bit of it here. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence for the entrance, I'm at uh, Hebrews ten nineteen. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence for the entrance into the holy sanctuary by the blood of Christ, by the new and living way, which he integrated for us through the curtain that is his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us with a true heart and full assurance of faith, uh, let us approach with a true heart in the full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For the one who promised is faithful. Again, some of this can kind of track, but then it can kind of be like, okay, well, what are we, what are we talking about? Where are we going? I think we got to remember what who is he talking to? He's talking to a group of believers who are um, struggling in their faith, who are being persecuted, who are um, being tempted to try to establish a righteousness of their own outside of Jesus Christ. So after, after he goes and he breaks these things down, he kind of goes back into encouraging them to hold on to their faith because they're uh, being pre persecuted. So 23, doo -doo -doo -doo, let us hold, 1023 says, let us hold fast to the confession of our faith without wavering for the one who promised is faithful. And let us think about how to stir up one another to, to love and good works, not abandoning our meaning together as is the habit of some, but encouraging um, each other and so by proof, I'm uh, sorry, and by so much more as you see the day uh, draw near. I, I laugh because, you know, that that definitely that uh, Hebrews 25, and it's like it's, it's close to being right, but it sometimes I think it all, it does get kind of, I don't know if abuse is the right word, but used uh, liberally. 
And that is like, oftentimes when you think about like church and when you think about like, you know, don't forsake the, you know, when they had COVID um, and, uh, the, you know, and some of the churches had to close temporarily. This was a scripture that came up a lot. Like, no, we can't forsake the uh, meeting together. We can't, you know, I, 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 I don't. I mean, um, you know, as sure as I can be that this is not that that's not the context of what he's saying. Like they didn't have like the church structure, obviously, as we have it then. I, I, I there is a obligation, there is a commitment that we need to be committed to each other, that we need to be in fellowship. Does for them the only way that they could do that was like physically being there. But there are multiple ways that we could do that. And so um, I think people kind of go to extreme ways on this. It's like people who have an issue with church will kind of abandon all sense of accountability, all sense of community, because they have an issue with the regular church structure. And so they really don't have a community of believers. Like it's just them and they think that's okay. I mean, this obviously not, and this is what the writer Hebrew Hebrews is um, kind of encouraging them not to do. But then on the flip side, there is this facade of meeting together where as long you, you, you have to come and sit in this room and somehow by us sitting all in this room together and then leaving, uh, we are we are in a real covenant relationship with each other as believers. That's 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 also not the case. So I think when we look at this in Hebrew twenty five, it says let, let us not abandon the meeting together as the habit of some, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another. And uh, by so much more, as you see the day drawing near, is that this does speak to the need for us to have a genuine community of believers that um, we are mutually accountable to, that we are growing with, that that we know, that know us, that in encourages us, that we are encouraging and we are connected to and we are walking this faith out together, that we're not... We're not doing the facade of community, and we're not abandoning community. We're like we're having real, genuine relationships with other uh, believers. Let's uh, let's go down here. Uh, verse twenty six, and we talked about this a a again. Verse Hebrews ten twenty six gets quoted so much uh, independently from the not only the rest of Hebrews, but also the rest of Hebrews 10. Now I want you to think through, right? You're gonna you're gonna hear some some trigger words, that word's being sin and deliberately sinning, that will kind of trigger those kind of traditional thoughts. But I want you to think through, definitely if you've been following through Hebrews, what it is that he's been talking about. What it is that the writer of Hebrews is trying to emphasize, and all the other times he would emphasize this one point about Jesus and then kind of encourage and warn, warn them. The warning here is kind of similar to um, the one in Hebrews chapter 6. But also just think through what we just read about in Hebrew, earlier in Hebrews chapter 10, where he talked about um, the, all the, the work of Christ, all the things that that Christ has done for us on the cross, the redemption of sins once and for all, and trying to avoid establishing our own righteousness. And then we get here, and again, he talks about not abandoning the relationship one, with one another, but stirring each other up. And then we get here to Hebrews 10, 26. He says, for if we deliberately, after, if, if for if we keep on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fire and a fiery a fury sorry a fire that is about to consume the adversaries. 
anyone who rejects the law of Moses. Again, this is important scripture and tying what he's talking about. Anyone who rejects the law of Moses dies dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. So if two or three people said that you rejected the law of Moses, you out of you was out you out of here, right? And this whole scripture is trying to establish what the work that Christ has done is superior to that of Moses the law X Y Z. So he goes in here, anyone who rejects the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more punishment do you think the person will be considered worthy of who treats with disdain the Son of God and who considers ordinary the blood of the covenant by which he was made holy and who insults the spirit of grace? Why? Because here, uh, every high priest of 10 11, every high priest stands every day serving, offering the same sacrifices many times, which are not able to take away sins. But this one, after he had, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God. And then also when you think about what we read in Isaiah 53 and, and, and the, 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 the suffering and everything that Jesus went through for our redemption, for our forgiveness, so that we can be restored in right relationship with him, if we look at that and say, nah, that is still not good enough to take care of me. That is still not good enough uh, to take care of my sin. I need to add to that and establish a righteousness of my own based upon works, based upon the law. As if the blood of Christ was just a common thing, as if the blood of Christ did not cost him everything. It's like, no, you you, you sure. And, and again, I think what the writer is implying is, yes, there's a certain wrath that comes to dismissing the work that Christ has done for us on the cross as um, not valuable enough to, to take care of our sins and seeking to establish one of our own. But then also, there's a, that doesn't work. <laughs> there's not another option. So it's like, yes, there's a wrath for kind of like disrespecting uh, the blood of Jesus for lack of, of better terms. But then there's also a wrath because there's not another option around that. It's like, you know, I don't like this door. I'm going to take a window. Well, ain't no windows in this room. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It's like this is this is the only way that we can be restored. A faithful belief, a faithful committed belief in the work that Christ has done for us on the cross. Separate from our sins. And so... For them, these works may have been circumcision and, and different things of kind of the law. But I, I, I do think it's worth asking and thinking about, like, hey, like, what are the things that you and I do, excuse me, that speak to us feeling like the blood of Jesus is not good enough to cover us? to cover our sins, that it, that we still need to add to it, that we, that, that God somehow is still um, so mad at us, that God somehow still does not desire relationship with us, that he does not desire closeness. Like, it's like he made the step. Again, you got that, if you got a friend who wronged you, and they're, they're like, oh, my goodness, will you ever forgive me for the wrong that I did? And you make the step to like, and you, know, you know what I mean? You make the step to prove that we are good. And if they still reject that, then it's like, yeah, you, 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 don't, you don't want this. 
And I think I'm trying to think through what that looks like for us now as believers. I think, uh, you know, and I think it goes back to what we read in the beginning of Hebrews, his desire that our consciences would be clear, that our consciences would be clean. And I think, um, you know, we, we, we talked about it before where guilt or shame is the leftover residue from guilt. So like if you do something wrong, let's say you you lie. Guilt is uh I lied. I, I did I I did this wrong thing. I, I wanna be, you know, this is this is wrong. And so maybe you lie and then you go, you tell the truth. Well, in a in a general case, that guilt is appeased because you felt guilty because you did this wrong thing, but you went and you did the right thing to kind of appease that guilt. Now, shame is like the leftover residue from guilt. So let's say you lied and then you restored it. Shame says, yeah, but I can't even believe I lied. I'm a liar. I am this way. Shame, shame's thing is not even about the, 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 the action. It's like you define yourself by the wrong thing that you have done. And now that affects, you know, when Adam and Eve first sinned, you know, and we said this before, one of sin's, sin's first gift was shame. Adam and Eve sinned, and then the first thing they felt was shame. And and um, shame because they were naked, and, and so they, they hid themselves. And so from the... Con- conception of sin, it has always been connected to shame. And when they felt shame, the first thing they did was they hid from God. And so from in our context, where we might not be big on sacrifices and whatever, some of us are hiding from God. Hiding. Some of us, as Hebrews has encouraged us to do time and time again, says, let us approach the throne of grace boldly. Some of us are not doing that because we don't feel worthy. We don't feel X, Y, Z. We still carry this shame. Well, that also kind of says that like the, the work of Christ wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to to take care of your sin. We're not talking about being unrepentant, right? We're not talking about like uh, I'm a freaking uh, axe murderer, and you know I'm just going to freaking I don't know. This is, I guess this is a harsh example, but like kill people and then go to worship the next day. Like no, there, there still has to be repentance. There still has to be like a you know that whole process of repentance. I was just reading something actually today about repentance. I'm trying to remember. It's like. Um, and uh, Judaism, there is like three parts of repentance. It is one of action. I think it's one of like sorry, one of action, and then one of uh, direction. I, I, I forget. We, we, we kind of talked about it before. Where repentance is not just saying I'm sorry. It's not just changing your mind. But it's actually, it's like saying I'm sorry, changing your mind, and moving in a new direction. So it's a change of mind, heart, and direction. And so once we do those things, we're like, man, I, I messed up and we decide to change our mark, our mark, our mind, our heart, and our direction. We can't carry the the shame of what we've done upon us. Like this is why Jesus died across our sins. We just, you know, we just uh had Resurrection Sunday. Uh this is this is why we celebrate these things, because we can be restored. Again, in the context for them, sin was a breaking of the relationship. Yes, it was the act, but it was also the the impact that that act had on their relationship. And so this whole thing, and this is why, you know, it's just, it's, it's just so amazing how things connect. This whole thing is about establishing us 
in right relationship with God. And so if you are allowing things, shame, guilt, unbelief, um, self-righteousness, doubt, whatever, to distance, to allow you to distance yourself from God, that is, you know what I mean? It's like, it defeats the whole purpose. That is, that is, that is false humility. That is false righteousness because he did all of the, all of the work, all of the suffering, all of the blood, all of the torture, the feeling distance from God, all of that is so we can be in right standing with him. And if we're like, no, oh, yeah, you did that, but you know what I mean? You weren't, you know, you didn't have me in mind. It's like, no, come on. Like Christ's suffering was before you even born. So every sin that you have done, you will do. He had, he decided to make a way for restoration. Prior, it's like, you good. Will we, will we, believe, goes back to believing the belief, will we believe that? All right, let's um, finish off this chapter here. Uh, do, 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 and this is where, yeah, this is where it kind of gets, uh, so 20, uh, 26, and if anyone rejects the law of Moses, uh, without mercy, on um, 28, sorry, if anyone rejects the law the Moses, dies without mercy on the testimony of two, two or three witnesses, how much worse will, how much, uh, how much worse punishment do you think the person will be who considered worthy, uh, will be considered worthy of who treats with disdain the Son of God and who considers ordinary the blood of the covenant by which he, he made us holy and who insults the spirit of grace. For we know that that one, for we know the one who said vengeance is mine, I will repay, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing. Come on. Come on. It's amazing to switch. Like this whole thing has been about like, and he does, like, God loves you, the, 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 the sacrifice of Jesus. And that was like, but this is also not a game. It is a terrifying thing, verse uh, 1031. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But remember the former days in which after you were enlightened, you endured great struggle. Again, he's talking to people who have been persecuted. So, been persecuted and going through uh, very difficult things, right? But remember the former days in which after, again, this is, and this is kind of my own little side note. We, we like to take, and sometimes it, it, it's applicable and it works, but it's like, we like to take everything definitely in messages when people are preaching and trying to make it about us. So like here he's talking to a specific people about specific instances about specific things, right? Remember the days in which um, after you were enlightened, you endured great struggle and suffering. I mean, and some of this does apply, but then it's like, you know, the messages you like, okay, remember when you first got saved and you were going through and your bills were unpaid? He's like, no, that's, that's not what he's talking about. Like these people were really going through because of what they believed. Um, about Christ, and sometimes, I'm sorry, getting back to uh, 33, sometimes being publicly exposed both to insults and afflictions, and sometimes of becoming shares with those who were treated in this way. For you both sympathize for prisoners and put up with seizures of your belongings with joy because you knew that you yourselves had a better and permanent possession. Come on. Like, I just like how, he, you know I mean? You know, everything doesn't turn around to a gospel song. Like, I lost it, then I got 10 more. Like, no, he he's saying, when you guys, when you guys got enlightened, right? And this is the thing, Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God. He was telling them to repent, to change their minds, not from, from actions, Right? Because, like, I mean, you think about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were some of the most, I mean, they definitely had the issues, but part of their pride was is what kept them kind of from sinning. You know what I mean? When when um, the Romans came, I want to say the Sadducees, they kind of embedded themselves in the culture and kind of compromised a bit. The Pharisees were like, no. You know what I mean? Like, 
uh, between the end of the Old Testament and when Jesus comes, they had just got done fighting this big Jewish war because of things that the Romans wanted them to do that were disobedient, disobedient to God. And so I say that to say when Jesus comes and he's He's saying repent. It's not just this thing of actions. It's not saying repent for that person you were sleeping with or repent for this sin. It is like, no, change your minds about what you think makes you righteous before God. And so here he is reinforcing this when he says they were enlightened, right? They came to the revelation, the wisdom, the revealing of what made them righteous before God. They, they came to that. And when they came to that, they suffered many things. People got put in prison. They were treated badly. They, in verse 34, it says, you, you, um, you both sympathize with prisoners and put up with seizures of your belongings with joy. Not because you knew you were going to get it back tenfold or X, Y, Z. No, because you knew you had to obtain something better than what they took away. It wasn't about, okay, God, are you, are you going to give me this? Are you going to give me these possessions back? It was like, no, I am so grateful for the redemptive work of Jesus Christ that ne- the, the, and, and the relationship with God that I can now possess. It's like, okay, they're like running in the house taking stuff. They're like, what I got, destroy I have to do. The world can't give it. Like what I got, you cannot take away. You cannot seize. Um, and this is the faith. <sighs> that he's trying to remind him of. And I'm I'm just, I'm thinking about uh, Paul when he's writing the letter in Galatians and he's encouraging them saying like, don't get worried, well doing. And then even in Hebrews, it says, it, it talks about this thing of like patient endurance. Like these people, and this is kind of the ebb and flows sometimes of our relationship. How can these people go from getting their belongings seized, but they still have joy because they are aware of what they possess, to now he's needing to write them this whole kind of thesis, this whole thesis to get them back to remembering what it is that they have. And I think for us, when we receive Christ, and, you know, Jesus talked about it when he talked about uh, the soul and the seed. He talked about the people who received the word with great joy, right? But when persecution, when trial comes, it comes and chokes the word and they lose it. And so you see this here in Hebrews that these people are, though they had received the, the word with great joy through enduring many sufferings and, and, and keep that in mind when we go to 11. He talks about, you know, the, the sufferings of, 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 of other believers. Like, it wasn't like they were just fickle. These aren't fickle people. These are people who gave everything for, out of gratitude and endured many things. Thinking about the work that Christ has done. And then there's like this process of time where I don't know if it is assumptions, like we think things will work a certain way and they don't, but like time passes and these, I I don't know if it's unspoken, sometimes it's spoken, but these things that you thought God would do don't happen. And these things that you thought would happen just don't happen. And slowly you lose that faith. And then your brain is like, well, and it's really just like an unmet expectation that probably didn't even come from God. Um, It's just how we interpret what was happening to us. So, for instance, if these people aren't doing something, and I don't think this will happen to them, they can maybe have the belief that, okay, in a couple weeks, I'm going to get my stuff back and everything's going to be great. But it's like, no, what if I, what, what if, what if it doesn't turn around the way that I want it to? Am I still so grateful 
for something that I cannot lose. This is why Jesus says, uh, store up for yourself what treasures in heaven with thieves and moths cannot rot. Like, am I so, many people are so mad at God for stuff that, like, is, is temporary. But the, the thing that we cannot lose, we just, we just don't find value in. You know what I mean? And, and, and we take it for granted. So um, 35, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For we have in we have need of endurance. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. For you have need of endurance in order that after you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. 37, yet... Yeah, a very, very little while, and the one who is coming will come and not delay. My, my righteous ones will live by faith or faithfulness. And if he shrinks back, come on, this goes back to the faithfulness. This goes back to the commitment. It's not about just believing. It's about being committed to believing and, and, and what that means. But my, uh, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul is not well pleased with him. But we are not among those who shrink back to destruction, but among those who have faith to the preserving of our souls. And then it goes on. Now faith is the realization. We're going to get into that because let me tease a little thing. Hebrews 11 is not defining faith it is it is speaking to how faith operates and we will deal with more with that on um next week next week we talk and, and it's just again and and this is the importance of studying scripture right because if you just read these scriptures and like a top, if you just hear them in a topical message or you just read them off like a gift card, like there is a whole world of context around this thing. So when we get to Hebrews 11 and we're talking about faith and for, for us as modern believers, faith has so much to do with what the specific actions that we want God to do for us. If you keep in mind the context of Hebrews 10, on back, and now we're getting to faith, we see that the faith that is being valued here is a commitment to correct belief, is a, is a, is a, is a believing commitment, a faithfulness to believing in the work that Christ has done on the cross. But like when we don't, when we don't walk through these books and we don't look at scripture in context, we just take, oh, Faith is the substance of things hopeful and evidence of things not seen. I believe that I'm going to get this just because that's, that's not how it works. And so uh, we will we will be looking at faith uh, next week. And then next week I have I share my stuff together. I got some temporary uh, equipment right now, so that's what I'm having. Some problems. I'm out here on a Chromebook. Come on. What is this? This is a toy. It's a Chromebook. Um, but, uh, Next week I should got I got my stuff in the shop. Next week uh, I should be back. We'll be back rocking and rolling and dealing with uh and dealing with the good stuff. So uh yeah, so that's it. Uh, Hebrews ten. I, I I think um I always try to think of like what we can really walk away with this, and I and I think for me. Again, so much of our belief comes to being about situations here and things that we want here that we want to work out on our behalf. You know, whether I want this job, I want this wife, husband, I want this experience, I want this career, I want this business, all that is whatever's cool, but that but that kind of dominates our kind of perspective on faith. But what walking through Hebrews chapter 10 just reminds me is like there is a 
super important belief that I need to be committed to. And what does being committed to that look like? What is being, what is a believing commitment of believing that the work that Christ did on the cross was once and for all, and it took care of my sin so that I can be in right standing and right relationship with God? What is my faithful commitment to that? You know, off the top of my brain, I would, I would think that would be a commitment to my relationship with God, a commitment to growing with him, a commitment to, out of gratitude, for grace, for mercy, a commitment to that, a commitment to, yeah, a, yeah, growing in my relationship with God, fostering it, um, nourishing it, and growing it because it cost him everything so that I can have it. All right, but we will uh, dig more into this, into Hebrews chapter 11. All right, love, appreciate you guys. I'll probably pull this down, cut out the, uh, the I had some technical difficulties in the beginning, um, cut out the technical difficulties and then I'll re-upload it, kind of more concise. Uh, but yeah, we'll be back, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 next week. Love, appreciate you guys. Without any further ado, we are up podcast this Thursday, nine o'clock. Come on, somebody. The Short Repeat Podcast. We'll be here this Thursday, nine o'clock, chit chatting it up. All right, love, appreciate you guys. Peace and blessings. Out.